Hello and welcome to another Be Your Own Law podcast. I'm your host, Matt Halloran. Today we are interviewing Nate Big Easy Lofton, a basketball player, a globetrotter, visited over 90 countries, holds two Guinness World Records, is a true liver of life, and an all-around amazing human being. Nate, welcome to the show. Be Your Own Loud. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I start off this the, the show with the same question to everybody, which is, tell me your story. How did you get to be where you are today? Well, I'm known as, as you know, Nate Big Easy Lofton. So that means Big Easy. I grew up in New Orleans. Uh, I was born uh, April 15, 1981, Charity Hospital. Maybe everybody from New Orleans know that's called the City Zoo. Different place. My mom, my dad, you know, both of them had to drop out of school early. My mom actually did finish high school um, when they was young. My dad had to drop out of school when he was 11 years old, take care of his grandparents, his parents. You know, he hustled. He sold drugs and, 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 and did whatever he can do at 11. You know, he was in sixth grade. He dropped out of school. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine that at all. At the age of 20, him and my mom had me. My dad actually went to jail for three or four years from doing his, his, his things he was doing in the street to being an uneducated black man trying to, trying to pay the bills. He was supposed to do a lot of time. He, he wound up not doing that time. Came home. My mom had, had my brother by then. My dad got, got home and told you know, my brother's father that, hey, he's back. He wasn't that was supposed to come back, but he's back now. So my dad, was, he was back home in the picture. So he didn't sell any more drugs. After that, that day when he came home, he wanted to do better. But unfortunately, he did get addicted to drugs and alcohol. Growing up, grew up in the projects of New Orleans in the 90s, murder capital of the world. It was the toughest time to, to be a young kid growing up in the neighborhood I grew up in. I, I enjoyed it, though. It wasn't, that's not a sad thing to say. I didn't know I was poor. I didn't know I was broke. Uh, I didn't understand the violence and the murder and everything I was seeing. I thought that was the normal thing that everybody was doing you know, around the around the world, around the country. For me, I, I was lucky. I grew up. I had my mother and father in the same household. Growing up, it was probably a bunch of us in the neighborhood, in the projects. And I was literally, me and my brother was the only one to have a two-parent home. Even though my dad was on drugs and, and, and he worked his butt off, he was a long shoreman, he went to work every day. You know, drugs or not, alcohol or not. He went to work every day, 12, 14 hours shifts, working on the river, on chicken boats and stuff, things like that, to make sure we, we, we had the, the basics. Seeing that work ethic, even though he was going through so much, you know, I, I couldn't imagine mentally, but so much just, just, just as a man trying to navigate everything, uneducated, with a sixth grade education, he did all right. He did all right. You know, my, my brother, he was managing restaurants in the, in, the, in the airport before the pandemic. And now he's a GM for the Buffalo Wild Wings you know, I'm in the West Bank in New Orleans. And of course, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. So I, I think my dad, you know, he passed away a couple of years back. So I think he would be happy with his struggles. But anyway, I just grew up in the, in the 90s. I grew up tough. I saw a lot, you know, I think I might saw my first murder at six, seven years old, something like that. And it just never stopped. That stuff, it makes you tough. It, it makes you think different in life. And with the, the things you look at, you look at them real different from your, your normal 9, 10, 11 year old. The decisions I was making at 13 or 14, it wasn't this, oh, if I do this, I might get grounded. I might, you know, get punished. I might lose my allowance. It's like, no, if I walk through that courtyard, I might die. And I was as simple as that. I'm very calculated in everything I do since then. And, and it's because of that upbringing. Went to I played ball, um, played bitty ball, basketball. That 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 was pretty cool. Didn't get to play AAU ball because I had to work summertime to pay for the uniforms when school come back. Once I got to a certain age, once I got to 14, 15, everybody started playing AAU basketball, you know, the summer league, travel league, whatever. We couldn't afford that. We couldn't afford it at all. So I had to work to pay for the uniforms for me and my little brother. Once my dad got injured at work, just understood life early, had to understand how to take care of my family early. When I was like 16, 17, my dad got hurt. As I say, he was a longshoreman working on the river, working at the bottom of chicken boats. A guy almost got hit by a, a massive um, roll of paper. 
it almost it was falling on him and my dad pushed him and saved him but it clipped my dad um foot uh, almost severed it off it didn't though so he couldn't work for a little bit my mom had to stop working to help him heal up and that was right when i was supposed to go off to college so i had to turn down the scholarships and i was like six five six six um had a couple of scholarships Turned those down and I went to work. I worked um, at Acme Oyster House in the first quarters in New Orleans on, on Oliverville Street. One of the most famous places down there for get some good oysters. I was six, so I, I started busting tables. I was dishwashing first. So I don't know if you ever saw a, a dishwashing area in the restaurant. It is not made for a guy who's six, six <laughs> over. No, it's not. <laughs> yes, I went home with a lot of cuts and scrapes and bruises. I had my first daughter. She's 21 now. I had my first daughter during that time then it was time so i worked there for two years took care of my mother took care of my father took care of my brother my my, my daughter i uh, did everything i i had to do working that job working double shifts busting my butt for two years what's crazy is um i grew from six nine to six 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 nine over that two-year period uh in between school so it's actually you know it kind of worked out for me so i went from a undersized um, big man who probably wasn't going to get too many D1 offers to a legitimate 69 power forward. I didn't play any ball during that time, though, but I was working, coming home. And, and one day, man, I, w- I came home. I had my second daughter while I was in school. But I, one day I came home and I was smelling like shrimp. And my daughter was still up. And I went to give her a hug and she was like, oh, that, that's stinky. And I was like, man, I can't, I can't, this can't be me. This can't be who I'm going to be. This will happen two weeks later. My dad, he was like, he's healed up. He's going to be able to go back to work. So my mother was going to be able to go to back to work. So they was going to be fine. I didn't want to leave them unless they was going to be okay. Yeah. And that was my main thing. So I talked to a guy named Glenn Amatrot. Uh, Glenn Amatrot, he's the um, he's with the GM there. And now he's the um, GM at, uh, at Mahoney's Pool Boys down in New Orleans. It's an amazing spot. He was like, man, you need to go back. To, you need to go to college. This is not... This is not who you should be. You're you're bigger than this. Oh. And so I talked to my guy, Coach Glenn Ciprin, uh, who was the head coach at a couple of schools, and my mentor, my high school coach's best friend, and still to this day, I, I lean on both of them, my high school coach and him. And I said, hey, man, I need to get in school. And he was like, okay. He called me the next day. I got a school. It says Independence Community College in Kansas. And I said, all right. And I was like, well, what do I need to do? He's like, I got your flight. Because it was like right when school was about to start, August 2001, August 20 something, 2001. So I got there, got to school, it snowed. I didn't have any, I didn't know what what, what was that, what was snow coming from Louisiana. <laughs> uh, then the next week, 9 11 hit. So, like, I'm just lost. I don't know what's going on in the world. No internet then. So, it's just you're looking at, so it, it was kind of weary. Looking back on it, played one year there, transferred to another school, college, junior college, because at that school in Kansas, if anybody know about the junior college conference, you're not allowed to get a full scholarship. Your, your scholarship had to pay for your um, room and board or something like that. I had kids. I needed to, I needed my full scholarship. Yeah. So I got went to Swinson Junior College, went to Fort Smith, got the full scholarship. That way I was able to send my Pell Grant home. Sitting in my Pell Grant home, got the full scholarship. I was doing good. Had another baby. So uh, I got four year old, one year old now, uh, three, two, one. I can't think of the, the you know, years in the range. Went to Division One school. I wanted to be closer to home. I went to Southeast Louisiana University, like 45 minutes from New Orleans. I was down there. It was crazy. Tell you this crazy story how, you know, I was trying to take care of my family so much. I was on full scholarship, getting Pell Grant, and taking out student loans to send home money to take care of everybody. It was my responsibility. Once I did it at 16, everybody just leaned on me, which was fine. It's, you know, I, I, don't take, I don't say that as a negative thing. It just was my, it was the cards I was built, you know, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a good space player, so I wasn't tripping. I went, I went out and uh, I did my thing, did all the accolades in college and made all the, the great decisions in school and took the, had the best record ever for the school. The next year, I went to the NCAA tournament. We lost. I, you know, I had agents calling. I was going to be drafted. Mm. I made the dumb decision of dropping out of classes to work out. I only had a semester left to finish. I could have finished my school and worked out. Then I got hurt in the gym, open gym. Oh. No one even touched me. You know, LCL, MCL. 
leg was messed up. Come, it was t- it was coming to time to work out. I couldn't work out for the pre-draft. I had to heal. I had some workouts. I worked out with the Raptors, the Spurs, and uh, um, what now Pelicans was then Hornets. My agent got me in those workouts. Physically, I did well, but I couldn't pass a physical. You know, I know if we had doctors going to pass me with my knee swollen after every workout. Yeah. So just got better that summer and said, you know what? I was going to try to go overseas and play. Went to this camp up in Oregon. Um, it was like for the play in the Chinese Basketball Association. Oh. I had the opportunity to go over there. I went home. It was August 27th, 2005. So I was driving on the interstate. My dad picked me up. We was going into the city. It was the only car going into the city. Every car was coming out. Katrina was coming. Yeah. Katrina hit, lost everything. Long story short, well, long story even longer. We got 13 of us in one Ford F-150 Titan V8. That was my dad's truck. We drove to Houston. Um, We got to Houston. We got to Houston. My agent, Merrill, he got us um, two Motel 6 rooms for 13 people. So then he called me a couple of days later. The Globe Trotters in town, along with the NBA, doing it was doing a charity event for the survivors of Hurricane Katrina, putting on shows or whatever. And my agent was like, "Hey, you want to come in and, and go work out?" I was like, "Yeah, it's thirteen of us in two rooms. I haven't slept in <laughs> I'm four out. days. What? <laughs> yes, I want to do anything. You know." Yeah. But, uh, I called my one of my, my college teammate, who now is the um, he's the coach at. Um, I can't think of the school right now. It's, it's slipping me. I don't know why. He's a head coach now. Um, Amir Abdul Rahim. His brother Sharif Abdul Rahim played for the Nugget, played for the Grizzlies and Sacramento Kings. He's now the commissioner of the G League right now. He's like wow. the Adam Silver of the G League now. But anyway, he still was in the league, and I called and said, "Hey man, I need some shoes. I need some shorts." Kennesaw, Kennesaw State is the co- school that Amir is the head coach at. I don't know why that slipped my mind. And uh, Amir said, "Cool, I'm gonna call Reef, and we're gonna get you some stuff." Reef sent me some shoes, sent me some shorts. I went and, and worked out. I thought it was just a workout, but it was a tryout. Uh, Manny Jackson, who's the owner of the team at the time, first African-American to own a, um, a, a, a professional a sports team. I met him at his room at the Hyatt that night, which, you know, staying in the Motel 6, it was like I was walking <laughs> to Disney World. Yeah. And um, he gave me a contract that night. And wow. um, yeah, he gave me a contract that night. And he was like, and that was the most money like my, my mom and dad could make that in five years, you know, and it was only, it was an $85,000 contract. And he gave me a $12,000 moving bonus. And it was like, I had nothing to move. We just had a bag. I had a bag, you know? So he's like, he was really just giving me $12,000. So that was, that was, that was awesome. Moved to Phoenix because the team was based in Phoenix at the time. Okay. Now, 17, 18, however many years later, did a couple of TV shows. I've been to 90 countries. Met my wife on the road. Got two more boys. I've got another one on the way. My wife's like three, 50, 16 weeks pregnant right now, I think. Okay. Um, 16 or 18. I can't remember because the the everything's backed up on getting appointments. So I, I used to go off with appointment this is. <laughs> yeah. 16 weeks, 18. So I'm kind of two weeks off either way. So I hope she don't hurt me. Um, <laughs> and uh, just loving life, man. I did the Amazing Race three times. I met the Pope. Just hung out with Snoop Dogg a couple weeks ago. All right, Peter Snoop Dogg, his mom just passed. It's just, it just, you know, live the life you can write a book on. I've enjoyed it. Now I am, a, um, you know, I've been licensed as a realtor yeah. for six years. Um, I'm with Remax Momentum in Colorado now, doing that now. Train, I just got, yesterday somebody called me to come train their kid. And everything I do is about giving back. I'm doing, I'm just doing it. I'm just loving life and just enjoying my family. How were you able to balance all of this? I mean, traveling to 90 countries, you're doing the shows for the Globetrotters, you're a father, you're a husband, you're a real estate agent. How in God's name do you balance all of that, Nate? Well, like I said, my my dad was on drugs. He was an alcoholic and he worked 14 hour shifts. He was living in the projects. Every day we would have gunshots. So for me, be married, uh, with going on five kids. My wife's a doctor. I get to travel the world. I get to help people find homes mm-hmm. and, and do amazing stuff on that level. I get to train kids. I get to do basketball camps in the neighborhood. It, it could, could be, be worse. worse. Uh-huh. So, so for me, it's a, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I'm blessed to be able to do any one of the things that I'm able to do. I'll be. I would be happy with just being a great father. 
That sure. that's it. If you just can say, Nate, you gotta give everything up and be a great father. I'm okay with that. I strive to be a great father, a great husband, a great person, you know, and make sure everybody that I come in contact walk away with man. I really enjoy my time meeting him. Or whether it's in the airport, sure. the laundromat, clean it don't matter. And I think that's easy. You are a force physically to be recognized. When we talked previously, as we were kind of preparing for the show, you said, uh, I'm, I'm about to go to training camp to get you know back in shape to, to go ahead and, and yeah. tour with the Globetrotters. And uh, I, I said to you, well, what is it like having to try to keep up with all the young kids? Do you remember what you said to me? I probably say uh, what it's like for them to keep up with me. If, exactly. if, I, if I know, if I don't remember, but that's I, exactly been, what you said. Okay, yeah, yeah, because I, I talk crazy to them. I let them know. Like <laughs> my thing is, I rather shut a throng. I tell them all the time, like it, it shouldn't be lonely at the top. We all can sit up here yeah. and be bosses on the top of the throne, um, but you ain't gonna knock me off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you gonna knock me off. I'm, I'm up here until I'm ready to roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was fun. Went to camp. It was the first time doing some shows after 18 months hiatus yeah. from COVID. So it was good to see my teammates. Good to see the fans. You know, yeah. it got cut short, but it was awesome. You know, that was awesome. I, I was happy. I was afraid that COVID was going to retire me. So yeah. it was awesome to get back out there again. So if anything happened from here, at least I did it my way. You know. Well, but that's the interesting thing is is the impact that you make, and 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 you do this night after night after night. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm not just talking about with the globe charters. I'm talking about the right. fact you're doing it with helping people find houses in the basketball camps that you run for the kids locally and all of mm-hmm. that stuff. I I get that it could be worse. I get uh-huh. that you saw a work ethic, mm-hmm. but I want. Step out of that for a minute and look at yourself okay. in the mirror and say, okay, if I was able to distill my level of drive, mm-hmm. where does that power come from? It comes it comes from it comes from wanting everybody around me to be happy, right? It comes from wanting my kids not to want for anything. It comes from wanting my wife to not to want for anything and my mother. It comes from I've seen like I said, since six years old, murder, 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 mayhem. So it comes from like, okay, you're lucky to be here. Don't waste it. Mm-hmm. Why don't you waste it? You could have been the one that got shot in the courtyard when you was 13. You know, you could have one that took that bullet to the head, to the back of the head, standing in the bar. You could have been the one when they pull up to rob the heroin side and they picked the wrong side of the project. They got shot with the the, with the, shot, the, the shotgun. You wasn't. There's some reason you're here. Have fun. And go have fun. Why waste it? Like, who cares about anything? There's a guy I grew up with named Sadie. And he always said, money come and go. And you never really realize that it's easy when you don't have money to say that, right? Yeah. Then when you get money and you realize, like, okay, like, yeah, this is awesome. Money is going to open so so many doors. It's do- it does a lot. It enables you to do some things. Don't get me wrong. But it's not the end all be all. Like right now, I'm about to coach my son's basketball team. That is that right there makes me so happy that I'm going to be home to coach his basketball team. My dad only came to maybe two games my whole life because he was working. Yeah, you know, and it was you know it was it was a, my senior my senior day and one more game when we played in New York when we played against Tulane in New Orleans. And now, now he wanted to. I'm sure he did. I'm sure because he. he I love, but I don't get to go. I'm going to my son's soccer practice. Mm-hmm. I'm getting to do so many things. So for me, it's like I get to do all these things. It's a you know, it's a blessing, and it's a, it's you know, I'm lucky to be able to do them. So I'm gonna do them at the highest level. No one's gonna be better at doing none of these things I'm doing. You can't mess with me. I don't care what you say because <laughs> I'm a dog. I'm a yeah. beast. I'm a dog. Don't nothing. Nothing is what it what it is. It's just it's a, a negotiation for a house. It's a, I'm trying to when in college. I'm trying to score whatever. I'm trying to. I come from my mentality is different. When I was in college, I was trying to take care of a whole entire family, three generations of people. I was in charge of. I had to feed them. That rebound is just a rebound to you. For me, that's my livelihood. Yeah, I'm playing for life. For everything I do is for life, and I enjoy it though. Yeah. And I want to pass it down. I want these kids to see that 
you could come from where I come from and, and be from where they're from and still be great and still be a good person. You don't have to well, be a I, bad person. I want to talk to you about that because so in preparing for this, I take a lot of time to really distill my thoughts. And and I was on the fence to ask you this question, but you ahead, just opened the it. door. So I'm well, and you told me I could ask you whatever. So I don't care. <laughs> how do you balance the reality that you had growing up and how that really contributed? so strongly to your life's vision. And how do you translate that into kids who don't get it at all? Who that has not been their reality, that has not, your reality living in New Orleans in the projects is not a reality that anybody that you've surrounded with yourself right now really is experienced, not to that level, Nate. How do you communicate that to make people get it? Well, that's the hard, that's my hardest job, right? My hardest job right now is for for my own kids and for your kids. I'm sure how you grew up, no matter how it was, you wanted to provide better for your kids, right? You want them to Absolutely. be better than you, right? For me, I just say about kids I'm trying to help on the street. You know, at Pale, Boys and Girls, Boys and Girls Club, whatever I'm doing, right? Whatever I'm at, or just a kid standing in front of the grocery store. If I have to figure out as a leader, as a human being, as a man, as a mentor, how to bottle up what I've been through and maneuver it for it to relate to what they're going through, right? Absolutely. So I grew up to where if I didn't play basketball, I was probably going to die. Basketball saved my life. They don't have that same thing. They might be paying, their parents are paying whatever amount of money for me to train them and say I'm training them, right? They want me to put that killer into their son or daughter. That's the toughest thing I tell people. Like, listen, I can't put something in them that's not in them. And you shouldn't want that in them. For me, my daddy told me, you know, the Globetrotters, my first year, second year, I got let go by the guy who was working with the team at the time. It was a little snake. He did a snake move and they fell for it. And I got fired my, my first year on the team. And my dad told me, he was like, Nate, you made it through New Orleans in the 90s. You didn't go to jail. You didn't sell drugs. You didn't die. Mm-hmm. It was like every move you made, because it was based off of those three things. I don't want to die. I don't want to go to jail. And I, I, and I don't want to sell drugs. That's not who I am. So move accordingly. Treat everything the same. You know, don't treat because you're doing this corporate thing. Still treat it how you grew up. So I, I grab. So everything I do now, use the rules of, the, of those streets that I, I grew up in and I, I and I was able to get around without getting in no trouble. That is a feat. I, that should be one of my games yeah. world record, record. I got two of them. <laughs> that should be my third one. <laughs> Growing up in the project, you're not going to jail. But anyway, what I try to do is try to find something that I can, they can relate to that I can relate to. You know, I try to talk to them. I try to sit down with them and just hear them out because yes, I've been through this extreme stuff. Like, Super extreme stuff. Um, and they might just, just be going through having some mental health issues. They might sure. be going through 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 something small, parents divorce or anything. This kid having mental health issues because his parents divorcing and he's still multi-millionaire or whatever, is not the same as me watching two friends die. But mental health issues are mental health issues. I still have yep. to deal with this. He has to deal with that. So now we got to find, like, listen, I know this is not that, but this is how I dealt with this situation. So I want you to figure out how you can deal with this situation, okay? Sit down. Let's relax. Let's, let's go talk to a therapist. Let's find somebody to, to, to get this out of your system and help you in that way. Because I'm not, I, I'll never attempt to be a therapist. Or be, you know, I'm me. Sure. So I try to push them in the right direction and give them all the tools. To, to help them. I, it's still tough, though. It's tough for me because I'm like, well, man, I wish I had the opportunity. And that's how I look at it. I yeah. wish I had the opportunity. I wish I had my mom, I had a whatever truck or whatever in this amount of this amount of that. But you know what it helped me realize, helped me realize as a, as a man, everybody has issues. Yeah. It doesn't matter. If you're sitting over here with this golden egg or you're sitting over here with a cracked egg, we all have issues. So I enjoyed my childhood. I, sure. I, I love my friends from my childhood. I wish the violence and stuff was taken out of my childhood. 
I would go back and live that same way, poor and everything, if nobody had to die. Yeah. Because other than that, the lessons I learned growing up in that in that neighborhood, in that city, is the reason I'm here. The reason I am such a I, I, I am perceived to be such a great person. I am a good man, a good husband, and all that. It's because of the crazy stuff I saw growing up. It wasn't because of sure. nothing I learned in college. It wasn't because of you know what I'm saying. It was because everything mm-hmm. that happened to me before I was 21. Yeah. Now you just dropped something that I have to pick back up, which is that you have two Guinness records. What? What? Mm-hmm. What? I got a Guinness World Record for the farthest hook shot, and I got a Guinness World Record for the farthest blindfolded hook shot. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Okay. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. I'm a, That's I'm, cool. I'm a hook, That's... Hook, hook shot king. Hook shot king. Wow. <laughs> now. Let's continue on this this life of of ever changing learning and perspective that that you have. Ninety countries. Yes, sir. Over ninety. I don't know the number for sure. What is one of the biggest takeaways that you had from? I mean, I, I don't know. And you're the only person I've ever met, Nate. Just so you know, who's been, visited over ninety countries ever. Like, I'm, you're the only person in my whole life. And so now that I have your attention, <laughs> what <laughs> what is one of the biggest things that you gleaned from doing all of that traveling? I'm gonna tell you two things, all right? Okay. First, after I got with the team after the after Katrina, right? And I saw a lot of stuff. I saw bodies tied to stop signs because the morgue was underwater and it was flooded, right? It was just, it was unbelievable living those couple of days we did stay down there, right? My first trip out the country was to India. Oh. I went to Chennai, India, Chennai, India. It was hot. And it looked like they was living in Katrina every day. Oh. What I had just went through in that small moment of time, don't get me wrong, I'm not downplaying it. It was traumatic. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Those people was living that every day. But they were the happiest, nicest, giving, loving people I have still ever encountered in my time. Man, I called home to my little brother and I said, man, we just went through some stuff and we're going to bounce back. And we're going to be all right. And we're already blessed now. God bless me with this job and able to help, whatever. I'm like, but these people, this is what they, this is, this is for them. So when we saw in Katrina, I saw it 20 times worse. The kids were smiling. The adults were happy. Okay, I need to change how, how I think about stuff, what, what the material things really mean to me. You know, it's about finding that inner happiness, no matter what the situation is. And also, when I was doing Amazing Race, the first time I did, I did it three times. I was traveling, was going around the world, and, and, and sometimes you can stop and you can ask somebody to help you out, give you a dollar or two to get a burger, whatever. Um, that's how the game was. Anybody who was dressed nice, who had was in big cars or whatever, did not help us. People who had nothing standing on the sidewalk or walking or were dirt poor would buy us a burger, a milkshake. One guy even bought us a beer. Huh. Yeah, well, because on the race, I, all my worldly possessions, I can't, I can't take my credit card, debit card. None of that means nothing. I'm broke out here. Whatever they give me for that leg of the race is what I have. So if we want to get a, something to eat extra, we would have to work out magic and ask people for help. Never was helped by a person in a three-piece suit or uh, some beautiful high heel shoes. There's always somebody who was working class walking to work on the train or whatever that would stop and give us a coin or something to help us buy that burger. It made me realize like, don't judge not one single person by what you see, judge by what they do. Whatever they show you is what you judge it off. Forget the outside, get to know somebody, talk to them, how it goes, see the, the up, the down, the lows, stuff get real, see how they're gonna react. Don't just go off of, hey, this person looks nice, drive a nice car. That means nothing, that doesn't mean they're a good person. Why real estate? That just well, seems like a jump to me, Nate. I don't know. Like, all of the other stuff, and I'm like, okay, now, okay, help us with that. That's That seems to be an interesting life transition for you. Where did that come from, and why did that happen? My mentor I talked to him earlier, he was coaching at Oklahoma State. He, did, he, did, he coached at different uh, places. He has a lot of rental problems in New Orleans. Probably about 10 years ago, he said, Nate, when you retire, you should get into real estate, buy some rental properties, so forth and so on. I said, okay, cool. Or I want to learn about it. So I'm going to get my license and I'm going to be a real, a real estate agent. That way no one can 
do play no games and pull one over on me. Again, I grew up, you know, I got that mentality from yeah. the project now. So now everything I do, I'm trying to get ahead of the game. So I was like, okay, like I don't want to be a person trying to buy this rental property and this agent getting over or whatever. So I wanted to learn. So I went to, I did my classes and everything, got my license. And initially it was just to get, to get the license, to get the information, to be able to be inside the MLS and see stuff that normal people can't see. Mm-hmm. This lady called me. She she looked me up on the website. She was living in the night. She she had a had a, a place in the night war New Orleans duplex. She was like, I want you to um, rent it out for me. I was like, okay, cool. Like while I was home, like I, I wasn't going to be leaving for about three months. So I love, I should have enough time to, to, to do it. That's why I never would really take any listings because I can fly to go see the Pope tomorrow. Yeah. And I didn't want to do no, anybody that. I was doing it. One young lady came, she wanted to see the, the house. And I was like, okay, I'll meet you over there. She didn't have an agent. I got over there, opened the door for her. She was her and her son. She was a single mother. And she was like, oh, look at those fours. And it was wood, it was reefer, it was wood fours original. And the house was like a 1920 house, beautiful re- remodeled home. Her son said, mama, he was probably like six. He was like, oh, the refrigerator is silver. It never saw standing still. And I, and I said, I looked at her and she was like, well, I'm going to have to do this. And I, cause you know, I was running the credit checks and I was doing everything. I said, okay. She was like, man, this would be so awesome for him to live somewhere like this. We were living with my aunt right now. And I was like, where they live at? And she told me where they live at. It was a project. It was, uh, and I was like, man. And she was like, I'm just getting out of college and I'm just getting, getting my job and I'm trying to do better for him. And that hit hard. Yeah, that hit hard for me. I never had wood floors. I never, I had, I never had a dishwasher or nothing until I was paying for it. You know, me and my wife. So I understood that, and I was like, man, I didn't see none of this stuff till I got in my twenties. If I could help her show her son this at six years old, mm-hmm. how good would he be when he get in his twenties? Wow, that's cool. So I sat down. I talked to the lady who owned the home, and I said, listen, I want to. I understand she's not the most qualified, but if we can, I want to give her a chance. And she was like, mm. well, why, Nate? And I told her the story. She started crying because <laughs> she was a black lady, you know, and there was a young black girl. And she was like, of course, let's do it. And mm. so I said, listen, if anything happened, I'll pay for the damages for the, uh, for the first year. And she was like, no, you have to do that. I said, no, I just, I, as much I, I, or whatever. After that, I was like, man, okay. This is this is cool. I can meet a lot of people, which I do already. I can impact families and kids, which I do already. So I was like, man, when I finish playing, I can still be fulfilled and financially be stable. That's why I chose real estate initially. Wow. First, it was just to get the knowledge. Then, when I realized people really can, can you can really help them. That's awesome. Like I, I, right now, this young lady, right now, she's. She's um, 20 years old. She's going to be the first person in her family to own a home. Oh. Yeah, her family come, came, came over from Mexico when she was younger. So like, I'm fighting for her you know, with the loan offer. So let's get her qualified. And we're going to get her. We're probably going to get her house this weekend when we go out. Wow. Um, she just got qualified for some more money. And and that's, I'm not going to make a crazy amount of money off that deal. But I'm going to get, I'm going to feel, I feel so good now telling you about it because I know I'm about to change her, her life trajectory. I'm about to change when she yeah. started family. They have they own something. I'm going to help her get that. So for me, now it's, a, it's still the same thing. I'm still helping people. When I get in front of the other agent, I'm performing, you know? <laughs> and I know I'm going to change a couple of lives. So that, that's why I real estate. I'm sure that there are people who are listening to the show right now or watching the show who are going to want to, I don't know, talk to you, thank you, hire you. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? And why would they reach out to you? Should you just want people to, I don't know, help us with that. Listen, I got so much going on right now. I, <laughs> I'm always, you want to, you want help with, with, you know, getting a house, selling your home in, in the Colorado area, hit me up. I got basketball camps coming up. I got one coming up with the, with the, with the rec center, the Paul, Paul Dirt, the rec center in Broomfield. I'm training kids again. Um, basketball season starting up. The, the assistant principal just called me at one of the schools and said, hey, man, can you train my son? I'm going to do that. Go to my Instagram. Go to my Twitter, Facebook. Just follow me. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm about family and fun, you know. 
yeah, just hit me up on any one of those things. You want to holler at me, ask me a question. I enjoy life. You know, I just went down to you know, New Orleans and helped out with the relief from Hurricane Ida. With it, well, teamed up with Pal, the Police Athletic League, and gave away grills and tents and stuff that you wouldn't think people need. You know, they hadn't had power for so many days, so it was awesome to go and do that. I just did a kids camp at at the daycare. Yeah, man, I got a lot going on. Um, but right now, my main thing is is, is the real estate. So hit me up, man. I love to work with anybody, help them out, and, and, and help their dream come true. That's awesome. Well, Nate, I want to thank you so much for not only everything that you've done, but but giving us the gift of your time for a few minutes today. So thanks for being on the show, man. Hey, man, thanks for having me. It, it was it was fun. I, I hope my story was was someone that would help at least one person out there, and then they can pass it down. Something that I just heard, and I want to kind of say as our closing here is. When you know how to fight and you flip that so that you don't have to fight for yourself anymore, but you keep that fight in you and you fight for others to make other people's lives better, that's a reason to live. And that's one of the reasons why I think you impact so many people. I appreciate that. People are drawn to you. So I want everybody listening right now and watching, think about that. How can you take that fight that you've had for whatever reason and turn that into something where you can help fight for others to have a better life? And if everybody did that, could you imagine what this world would be like? All right. So for Nate, Big Easy Lofton and all of us here at Proud Mouth, thank you very much for your time. And we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thank you for listening to Be Your Own Loud, where we reverse engineer success to help you accelerate your influence and break free from the torment of sales. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to our podcast, share it with others in your company or profession, follow us on social media. This podcast is brought to you by Proudmouth, the Influence Accelerators. Visit us at Proudmouth.com and join our Influence Accelerator Academy for free to enhance your marketing mindset and know-how.